Hey guys. Maya, Doris, Anthony, Sarah, are you guys? Cool. Um, are you guys excited about today's guest speaker? Nice. So ask, um, yeah, so we're going to talk about more about his uh, experience as a venture capitalist, uh, his VC fund, investment thesis, et cetera. Um, but um, yeah, make sure to have all your cameras on. We want to be very respectful to our speakers. I told Andrew, if we don't have enough cameras on, we're going to do a pop quiz afterwards. Um, so, you know, up to you guys. Okay. Cool, we got a few more people coming in. Is anyone taking summer school? Joseph? I used to do that uh, that capstone class, the business four seventy five hour summer. Okay, is it is it in person? Uh they haven't let us know yet. I'm not. I'm not really sure. I'm assuming it will be though. Okay, got it. Uh, just give me one second here. Hey, Kevin. Oh, hello. Never mind. I just saw the missed call. So I, I thought you wanted. OK. You know, sorry, I was just on a call to someone in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia and I'm trying to get off the call. And I didn't see the link in the uh, in the thing, but it, but it worked. We're here. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. So thanks for hopping on. So today's lecture is a little bit different. Um, you know, these are my students from my entrepreneurial finance class. Some of my students from launching a new venture are, are also joining as well. Um, but we want to hear more about your story as a uh, venture capitalist, right? So uh, for those of you guys who haven't had a chance to watch um, Andrew's session last week, uh, it seems like everyone did. Um, but just in case there's a couple, um, Andrew's one of my friends. He was uh, one of the first VC um, investors. Um, that ever invested in any of my ventures, a company called Dealflix. I'm forever grateful uh, for that. That um, really helped my career in, in various ways. Um, he raised uh, $48 million by the age of 28. Um, he's written three books, everything from uh, corporate finance to uh, topics regards to, uh, regarding uh, blockchain. Um, he's invested in numerous startups, and currently he's the uh, managing partner of 7BC Ventures, um, and, um, yeah, I really like, um, I, I guess like Andrew's background because he has a lot of experience, uh, working with a lot of international investors. So, uh, without further ado, um, Andrew, I'll, I'll let you take it from here. And Kevin, I know we, we spoke before, but just to make sure we're doing covering what you want, how many minutes and what do you want me to talk about? Um, so any questions? Yeah. Yeah. So 40, about up to 40 minutes, and then we'll have, um, you know, 15 minutes or so for Q and A. And then, you know, we'd love to just kind of understand your career and your journey as a, uh, you know, venture capitalist, how you got involved, how you got started, um, you know, talk about your investment thesis a little bit, raising money um, as a VC. Um, and um, yeah, we, we're trying to align your experience with one of the projects that our students are doing. So for their final project, they're supposed to create a VC fund or a PE fund and come up with their own investment thesis and okay. hypothetically put together a portfolio of companies that they would potentially invest. So we've been working on that project for about two, three weeks now. Okay, awesome. Well, like on that, I think that if you're starting a new venture capital firm, I think it's important to have an anchor LP, so limited partner that's putting in a cornerstone of money in capital and then use that as momentum to grow. So that's one, anchor LP. Number two is it's good to have, um, you need to have a team in place. Um, that's a backable team uh, that, that, that uh, you know, deserves to be doing this. 
And then three, you need some kind of differentiator. Some don't really have the differentiator, but I think it's important to say, what is unique about us? Or why is it that um, in a competitive deal, you know, Kevin would take my our money and not that of any other VC on this big list of VCs that are out there to choose from. Um, but on my journey, so I, my first job out of undergrad was kind of accidental and getting hired off the Career Development Center of University of Vermont. I had a job offer to work at a company called Pencom Systems that was in the Unix industry. So I kind of got very educated on technology and enterprise technology primarily uh, with my first job. I then um, started a startup myself and I managed to, I was pretty young. I was like 26 years old. I didn't have any money. I don't really come from money or anything. And um, what I did was I recruited a team of five people that were older than me that were really like the right people for this job. And I signed employment contracts with them saying, contingent upon me raising $5 million of funding, then you work for me as head of the network, you're head of sales, you're head of this, you're head of that. So I kind of, I kind of went out and hired my dream team where like everything was written down and signed. All I had to do was get 5 million in funding. I then went to Lucent Technologies. We needed telecom switches and services for this business. And I got them to say, we will give you $25 million of vendor financing, which is basically like a credit card to buy up to $25 million in their store, but contingent upon 5 million equity financing. So it was a five to one kind of debt on equity that I had from them. So I kind of put everything in place as like a perfectly polished deal. And then I ran a process to VCs to invest in that. And then that worked. We ended up getting a lot of money. And so to say it briefly, I've started a couple of companies myself. So, you know, when I meet someone like Kevin as an entrepreneur, when he was at DealFlix, I've typically, I've been in his exact shoes and I can empathize with the risk he's taking, the emotions he's having, the issues of, can I fire someone who just had a baby? Uh, you know, it's hard to do, but sometimes you have to do that if you're running out of money in you know, all kinds of, you know, hiring PR firms that are charging you a lot of money and you're getting no results, all those kind of things. So I've been an operator and I've had some success and some failures. So I've had an IPO, I've had m and and I've had failure in that. And then I founded a company called the Founders Club, where if Kevin owns, say, 20% of DealFlix, and based on the valuation of investors investing, his stock is worth, say, $20 million, but that's not cash. You cannot pay your student loans with stock in a company that's not on the stock exchange. So what I did was I let them swap some of their equity into a pool. And so I would get like, imagine every square I can see on this Zoom. Imagine each of you have raised between five and a hundred million dollars of venture capital and you each own between five and 30% of your company. You could each put like two to 10% into this. And now that basket, a limited partnership owns shares in 25 companies. And whenever one of them gets M&A acquired and that stock becomes US dollar cash, I would pay 80% to all the founders and 20% to myself. So if you guys all met each other at a Founders Club dinner, I have everyone go around and introduce yourselves and then say, okay, enjoy the dinner, have drinks, be merry and help each other as much as you can. So it's kind of like a fight club of CEOs. That became my anchor LP for my first fund. So I basically had all CEOs and founders and CTOs and directors of sales of venture backed startups with their capital backing our fund, which was pretty cool because they each have a great network. And, you know, Kevin, you've been to some of our barbecues, right? You know, for Rubicon? Not, not yet. Actually. Okay. Well, then, then um, I guess Sean was at those. Well, it, when, when the founders are in the same setting with all of these investors in the fund and the investors are from like, like the call I was just on was a guy in Saudi Arabia who's got 
over a billion dollars that he can invest. You know, you, when you have a diverse set of people, and he's also a Harvard MBA and really sophisticated person. When you have like somebody from Singapore, someone that's a family office in LA, family office from Jakarta, it starts getting very international and everyone has money in the fund and they all wanna support the startups. And so that actually becomes our differentiator. So remember I said Anchor LP, um, you know, source of cash, team, and how are you different? We've kind of become different based on, you know, who's in our fund. Um, Kevin, to, to, should I give a quick 101 on how two and 20 works and how venture capital itself works? Mm -hmm. That'll be really helpful. Okay. Yeah. So imagine that, you know, one of you, let me just grab a name, say like Adam Gonzalez and I decide to start a VC fund. And so Adam and I go out and call up all of our Chapman friends, talk to who do you know, who's got a lot of money, who's rich, you know, think of who you dated growing up, where did you spend your summers, just literally go after anybody you know, that can invest $100,000 or more. And so Adam and I scrape together 100 million bucks, and maybe it's even 5 million bucks, and let's start small, but I'll say 100 million for simple math. So if we raise $100 million together and Adam and I are 50-50 partners in the management company, that's called the general partner, the GP. The LP, the limited partnership, is where the cash goes. That's the fund. So what happens is Adam and I are so good, we're signing every day a couple of people. We get them in the fund. They wire the money into the bank account of the fund. There's 100 million bucks there. We charge a 2%, typically, maybe two and a half, but let's just say a 2% annual management fee, okay? And the management fee, we would draw down $2 million, 2% of the entire 100 every year for 10 years. And so over this 10 year period, we're able to get a bunch of interns from Chapman, the really good ones, we hire them when they graduate and we pay them a salary with this $2 million budget. Now 2 million sounds good. And it sounds like if I get 2 million every year for 10 years, I can live in a lot of cool places. The truth is it's gonna be a million for Adam and a million for me. And in fact, we have lawyers to pay and accountants, we have airplanes and an office and a ton of expenses. If we start hiring these Chapman people after the internship, they're gonna cost money and they're gonna have healthcare and blah, blah, blah. So we actually need the money just to stay alive and run the fund. If we didn't have 2% management fee, we wouldn't have a team. And so you wouldn't have a very high quality operation that you're running. So 2% times 10 years is actually 20% of the 100 million is going to management fee and 80%, which is in this example, $80 million, that's what we call the dry powder. So if Kevin comes along and says, I've got a new startup, I would probably back him without even really reading it, but of course I'll listen to him. But I love backing founders that I've already worked with and figured out which ones I, I think are good or bad. And um, we, we would put the $80 million into a bunch of companies. Now, I wanna talk a little bit about a misperception that this is risky. People seem to, the government thinks that any of you can invest in the stock market and buy stock in Walmart or Enron or whatever, and, and that it's somehow not risky. And they would let you be dumb enough to put it all into one stock and not even diversify. Whereas they, they don't think you're sophisticated enough to invest in a privately held startup or a venture capital fund. As you can hear from my, my tone of voice, I think the government is wrong about that. But with venture capital, it's actually less risky than the stock market and it's less risky than real estate, in my opinion. And this is how. If, if Adam and I now have $80 million of dry powder to invest in startups, what we would basically do is get an Excel spreadsheet and figure out exactly how we're gonna diversify that and how we're gonna double down. So what we would typically do is take something like 30% of the cash, the dry powder, and divide that across 25 different investments. So we spend 30% of our dry powder cash diversified across 25 deals. 
So think of that as 25 horses in a horse race, like you're at the track betting on the ponies. We're, we're diversified across 25 if even eight of them were to go bankrupt. And, you know, as a lot of my founders know, they sometimes go bankrupt. I'm very compassionate about that happening. And I don't even break a sweat. Like you never saw me get upset about anybody really going bankrupt because I know I'll get four of those 25 will pay all the money back. So it's a little bit like buying a lotto ticket. One of them's going to fail and one of them's going to hit the jackpot. If you get into 25 and you're in the deal stream and you have good deal flow and you know what you're doing and you're connected to the other, you know, kind of hot moving good VCs, you can get into good deals. A bunch will go bankrupt and maybe four would return all the money. You wait a few years and one turns into a really big company that could return all the money three or four times. So you're probably making like a five to 10 X cash on cash return with that 30% of the fund. Let's just go with square numbers and say that the dry powder is a hundred million. So we spent 30 million of our hundred diversifying across 25, which neutralizes the risk of any singular um, one shot investment. What is a little foolish and playing lotto is to invest in one early stage startup and stop. It's also foolish to invest in just three and stop. And a lot of angel investors, so individual people just going to a demo day or getting on angel list or trying to network their way into some deals, they don't have enough money or time to actually build up the diversification of 25 deals in a concise period of time. So we'll get into those 25 deals and literally just like two and a half years, we'll establish that. Now go back to the metaphor of a horse race. Some of them will start really running fast and being in the lead, meaning they probably have more revenue. They have big investors investing more money at higher valuations. When these 25 companies go to raise their next funding round, and we see one of them is doing really, really well, we double down and put more money into that company. So imagine that five of the horses are just taking off like Instagram, we would say never put more than 10% of the cash into one deal. That's too much risk to be more than 10%. So even out of our 25, our top five horses, if we went all chips in and did 10% on each of five, we now have 50% of the fund money, the total cash in five deals. And they are probably our best performing deals. So this basic idea is diversify and double down on your winners. Another thing is, raise your hand if you've seen the movie Wall Street with Gordon Gecko and Charlie Sheen. Jesus Christ, it's such a good movie. You should watch it. It was filmed a long time ago, but basically Charlie Sheen is running around on a motorcycle collecting information on publicly traded companies in an illegal manner. And Michael Douglas is the big hedge fund guy who's investing in publicly traded companies on the insider trading information he's getting from Charlie Sheen. And so he's big, he's breaking the law. He's an insider trader. It's like if Kevin's got a company that's listed on the NASDAQ and he tells me, oh, Andrew, I just signed Walmart. It's going to double my revenue. And I go and buy a hundred million dollars of his stock. And then, then he announces the Walmart on a press release. And so the market triples the valuation and I sell because it's liquid three days later, I go to prison. So spoiler alert, Michael Douglas goes to prison for being an insider trader. That's the law. For venture capital, we invest in privately held companies. They are not traded on the stock exchange. We have insider trading information because we're helping them as much as we can. We talk to them frequently. When they tell us, um, I just closed Walmart as a customer and I have a term sheet from another VC, that's a buy signal for Gordon Gecko. That's the name of Michael Douglas's character. So in a way, we are legally doing what Michael Douglas does in this great movie you should all watch with Charlie Sheen, Wall Street. And, but it's legal and we're not going to prison because we're not breaking the law. So that's just the idea that as far as investing in the stock market, 
I view that as either you're breaking the law, like you, know, you must have seen the TV show Billions, some of you, right? So that guy should go to jail because he's breaking the law because he's trading on information he knows that the rest of the market does not know. And that's why he beats alpha. He's delivering really good returns because he's a criminal who's not getting caught, okay? With venture capital, we're diversified, so there's no risk in my opinion. And we're basically legally investing more money into our top performing companies. So that's a little bit about you know, the asset class and having portfolio construction. Now I know VCs who are just out there passionately throwing money into deals without like adhering to an Excel spreadsheet like we do. We're very disciplined to adhere to that portfolio construction. A little bit on technology. Um, you know, we've got a slide that like if we're in Saudi Arabia trying to raise money, these people typically prefer to invest in real estate because if they, if, they, if they put the money into a new hotel, they can see the pool, they can see the dining area, they can see the elevator, they can touch it. You tell them, oh, we, we are investing in, I don't know, Salesforce. They can't touch the software as a service. Even if Kevin has a movie app where people are buying tickets, you somehow can't really touch it. And so I showed them the slide that says 20 years ago in 2000, the largest five biggest companies on the stock exchange by market cap, market capitalization, how much is, are they worth? It was all like Exxon, Mobil, Chase Bank. It was all dirty banks and dirty oil companies. Fast forward 10 years and Microsoft is in the top five. So that's a clean, green, no smokestacks software company. Then you fast forward and Google gets in there and then Apple gets in there. Right now, the largest five companies on the stock exchange are Apple, valued in the trillions. You've got Alphabet, that's Google, in the trillions. You've got um, Microsoft in the trillions. You've got um, Amazon in the trillions. And little Facebook is only worth like 830 billion or something. So all five are West Coast technology companies, no more banks in there. I heard that like um, Apple just announced a billion dollar campus in North Carolina, in Raleigh, Durham. They already have a billion dollar campus in um, Austin for a company in the trillions. We've never had, we never had a company valued at 1 trillion before. Now these are in the multiple trillions. What's happening in tech is crazy. For them to build a billion dollar campus and fill it with high tech people is the equivalent of Safeways opening a new Vons in you know, Orange County. It's like nothing for them. This is like the US Army beating the living crap out of Slovenia if they want to. So I think what we've seen in tech so far is nothing compared to what you're gonna see. On technology itself, we're at a point where machine learning and artificial intelligence are becoming like Lego blocks, like Lego bricks that you can stack a few together and rapidly create a new application. And we're at a point where you've got proprietary data. So like take any company and imagine they have data on their customers that nobody else has. They have data on their operations that nobody else has. We're at the point where you're gonna be able to just not even use a keyboard, you're gonna to speak to a device and say, I'm driving my car, what kind of oil does this Audi TT take? I don't wanna open the glove box, open the manual, look for what kind of oil it takes. You just speak to the car and say, what kind of oil does it take? Send it to my wife's phone. And then your wife gets out and sees it on her phone and goes and buys that oil. Pretty soon you're gonna be automating human workflows. So instead of somebody going to Chapman and getting a job at Pfizer reading clinical trial data of how many blood clots do women get from the Pfizer vaccine. Instead of humans reading through all this data, the machine will read it in like one second and the machine will be reading it through a human built um, framework that says, if this, then that kind of stuff. It's, just, it's a ton of, if this happens, do that. If this happens, do that. 
and it learns from itself. And so we're, we're at a point in history where every single company, every government, every university, every healthcare, everything is about to be using data to make decisions and it's software that's doing the thinking and it's humans programming it. So it's human intelligence programming artificial intelligence to harness data that has up until now been in a silo and is about to be connected with different data sets to make things happen. This will make a lot of money, it'll save a lot of money and it'll create more jobs for people. So don't worry about humans not having jobs. Like let's say you've got a big, huge Southeast Asian conglomerate and they employ 2000 accountants that do accounting. So they have a ledger tracking everything that's happening from sales to consuming of parts and everything. All of that's gonna get automated. So 80% of those jobs will disappear, but they probably don't have anyone working in cybersecurity to avoid Russian Chinese hackers or even South Florida hackers from coming in and stealing and disrupting their business. So they need to protect all this connected data and not have their customer data on the front page of the New York Times. We got hacked again by the South Koreans or by anybody. So you take those 80% of the people in accounting that love looking at numbers all day, never talking to anybody. They're perfect for cybersecurity. Train them on that. So I think that technology right now, where we are, is at the point where it used to be that Microsoft and Intel recognize we, we have to double the processing power every 18 months and make it cheaper. And we have to improve our business like crazy. We are in the tech business at Microsoft for enterprise, consumer, education, healthcare, everything. So they knew we need venture capital. We need to be in venture capital because we have to have this Moore's law of the processor doubling in speed every 18 months, Moore's law. Now, everybody is a tech business. Campbell's soup is a tech business. You shouldn't have sugar in Campbell's soup. It should be plant-based monk fruit. And you know everything is tech. And even if Campbell's soup just employs employees, do they have a 401k plan? Are they matching that? How is payroll done? How are, you know, how are you managing these humans? So basically the, the punchline is that technology is not just Microsoft and Intel anymore. It's every single human workflow in any industry or business. Like Kevin's probably gonna go out and buy companies that are not, you know, jacked up on tech and he's gonna pump them full of tech hormones and then he will create a ton of value. And if you invested in his deal, you're making money. He's just buying anything and injecting it with some modern tech stack, which will make it grow market share and destroy competitors and increase, increase sales, decrease volume, increase growth, stick that in a discounted cash flow, and the share price went up substantially. And hopefully he knows how to exit and sell those businesses. So I think that if for your careers, if you go into entrepreneurship on the tech side, you know, the idea of saying, I'm going to run out and build the next big pizzeria chain, that sounds insanely boring when you could have done something in tech. You know, I just think it's a crazy mistake to not be in tech. If you want to be in another industry, be the guy who's bringing tech to it. You know, like if you want to be in real estate, tokenize everybody's mortgages. If you start tokenizing everybody's mortgages on blockchain, it's stupid to own the house you're living in. If you could have owned some shares of real estate in London or somewhere that's going to go up like crazy, you know, as opposed to the one you're in. So I think everything is ripe for disruption. I think it's very exciting time to be a founder. There's more venture capital money out there than ever before. There's more accelerators than ever before. I had a call yesterday with a woman in San Diego from University of San Diego that's building a huge incubator where she said 90% of the startups that they're funding and housing and training in there um, have no connection to the university. So like all of you could go there and enjoy living in 
Del Mar or whatever. Um, so I think that the amount of funding opportunity, learning opportunity for young people going into entrepreneurship is at an all time high. Um, I think it's a great time to be an investor, even though there's a lot of funding out there. If you've got an anchor LP and you've got a good team and you've got a good track record and you have a differentiator of how you can add value and help these founders, you can get into good deals, diversify, double down and deliver a 10x plus return. If you compare what's happening for entrepreneurs and VCs in the privately held market before the Wall Street Gordon Gecko guys go to jail for being good at their job, um, the, the number of companies that are on the stock market today is 50% of the number that there were 10 years ago. So there, there's only half as many companies you could buy or sell stock in on the NASDAQ or the NYSE, New York Stock Exchange. Whereas the amount of money like that TV show billions in these hedge funds has increased by 10 X over the last 10 years. So to make a, a very crass metaphor, which will probably like get me fired if I were a professor at Chapman, that's like going into a bar as a single guy hoping to meet a woman. And it used to be there was lots of single women in the bar 10 years later, there's one woman for every 10 women that was in that bar 10 years ago. And there are 10 times the number of guys that just went into that bar. That is literally the situation with the stock market. So if there's a little bit of growth of, oh, this year revenues are up by 10%, everyone's like 10% revenue growth, let's all buy Zoom. And so they all, they all pump into Zoom. It's the only thing growing in the stock market. If you look at what ha what's happening underneath the surface, in the venture privately held world, our startups are growing like crazy. Yeah, we might lose 20% of them to go bankrupt, but the other 80 are growing revenue minimum 40% year on year, if not 7X like year on year. COVID itself has been a huge accelerant that has everybody thinking about the stuff that the VCs and the tech entrepreneurs have always been working on. Maybe we shouldn't stick the credit card into a machine and wait around to get old. That's pretty stupid. Like all the stuff that you know we were doing, everybody does. Like Walmart's online sales increased from April to March by 71%. That means there's some lady in Ohio that used to prefer to get in her car and go to Target or Walmart and buy a, a, a vacuum cleaner. Now she's figured out that she can get online and have it delivered to her house with more choice at a lower price. Congratulations to Ohio. They're coming online. So COVID has really pushed the whole masses to adopt the roadmap that we've, we've had for a long time. So I think it's an all time exciting time to start a career in the tech world and I think large corporations are recognizing if they don't access external startup innovation and bring it internally, they're in trouble. So maybe 10 or 20 years ago, or maybe 30 years ago, um, something like 90% of all the patents being filed in the United States were being filed by very large conglomerates. It was like the Fortune 500. You needed to be as big as IBM to create innovation and that that's where the patents are. Right now, the percentage of patents that are being filed from the large corporations, and believe me, Apple spends a lot on intellectual property lawyers, it's something like 20%. So 80% of the innovation is happening outside of the large corporates. And it used to be that uh, the top graduates from Harvard or Chapman, they all wanna work at IBM or Accenture or a big JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs. Now they all wanna be sadly, YouTube influencers or something, but those that are not those disgusting people want to uh, be the next Mark Zuckerberg. They think, oh, I want to be rich like a billionaire. Like, like, like that song, I want to be a billionaire. Really? You need a whole billion. So a lot of the human people are going into startups. And so if all the talent is going into startups, what's the strategy for the large corporation to access those people, that talent pool? So there's an amazing reptide of confluence of, of positive forces between the technology itself, 
the adoption of the tech from large corporations, the entrepreneurs fueling this and taking risks and VCs backing it, and then big, large 1% owners from Saudi Arabia and all around the world who put money in the VC funds to access it. And by the way, we do take money from small investors. We can take $100,000 as a minimum ticket to grow the network of people that goes back to our Founders Club days. So our cornerstone investor were all the CEOs of those VC-backed companies. And so we've learned that if you put a bunch of diverse people in a room with the founders, that barbecue I was talking about, that the people who have money in the fund start helping the entrepreneurs. And it's a little bit of a club too. These guys put a hundred grand in and he meets a billionaire who put in a hundred million in the fund. So it's interesting network. I believe in just network and a club mentality. So Kevin, why don't I stop there and either take questions from, from your class, from the students, or you drive, let's switch into kind of fireside chat mode and talk about whatever topics you guys want to cover. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a great call. So let's um let's pause for a second. Um, class, do we have any questions uh, for Andrew? Kevin, Kevin Kim. Um, I got one. Just in terms of um, exiting as an investor, in your opinion, um, when is the better? I I know it differs for every investor, but when is, in your opinion, the best option to exit? Okay, so. Um, one way to think about that is there's a continuum from pre-seed, like I invest in companies in the Starbucks on a napkin as an idea. So no team, no, no product, no revenue, all the way up to you got to have like, you know, MVP, but pre-revenue. So they've built the product, they bootstrapped, and then it goes on and on and on, right? You have like during the accelerator, before demo day, at demo day seed extension, late stage seed, pre-series A, and then it goes kind of series A, series B, series C, all the way up until they stop raising money. Like Uber's got like, they're up to like series Z before the IPO. And then there's either IPO or exit. And people are investing in a way of buying the company is either a change of control or the whole thing, or it gets public and you can go public and then that's an exit and then it could still get bought. So like Microsoft might buy a publicly traded company, you know, after it's listed on a big exchange. Um, you also have little exchanges. You can, you can go out on like a crypto exchange. You can go out on the TMX in Toronto or the ASX in Australia or AIM in London. Um, do, what's the right time? Think of it like an escalator. So it's going from like the company, somebody managed to put in $5,000 into their roommate's company for a, ver for a small percentage, but the valuation was like 1 million. And then they get money from a pre-seed fund or some angel group, some angels. Now the valuation was like 3 million. Then they raised it like 6 million. The point is the valuation keeps going up. Like Uber was raising money at a $70 billion valuation when it was still privately held, you know? Um, so if you invested, if you invested at a $3 million valuation, and you can make a 100x return by selling some or all of your shares on the secondary market while it's still private, that might be very good for you. If you invested in Uber at a $70 billion valuation, you are waiting for the IPO and praying to whatever God you believe in that you, you weren't stupid at getting into that at 70 billion. So that's the continuum thing. Um, you know, for us, we tend to invest in a little bit of raw seed, a little bit of late seed where they have about a, a million dollars of revenue a year mark. And then we put most of our money in when they're more like five, six million revenue. And then we create what we call special purpose vehicles, which is basically a VC fund to make one investment. And we only make that our SPVs available to people that are in the fund. So if you're in the fund, we diversify everything for you. But then when it gets to later stage, we show it to you and say, do you want to put more money into this one deal at this later stage growth round? Um, so it's like an escalator. Do you want to get off the escalator now? Or do you want to keep riding it up with the risk that it could go to zero and, and blow up on you? You know, it's like a, like a SpaceX rocket looks good and all of a sudden it explodes, right? That's why even on our best deals, we never put more than 10% into any one company 
out of a single fund. Um, a shorter answer for you is IPO is typically considered the best optimal exit. If it's good enough to get through those bulge bracket investment bankers, then that's probably good. There's, there's more demand because the government now allows everybody here to invest, where the government only allows some, allows some of you super rich people to invest before, which I think is total bullshit, but that's, that's the situation. So a, a simple thing of supply and demand, if there's a finite supply of inventory shares in the company and you increase the demand by you know, SEC rules and it's transparently findable from your advisors and your stockbrokers and whatever, you know, Robinhood, Coinbase, you can buy it. So IPO is the best, but IPO is still very, very rare. Even, you know, before the dot-com run up, it was rare. After the dot-com meltdown and Sarbanes-Oxley, it's rare. So M&A is the most positive outcome for a founder and a VC or angel investor. So M&A is where you expect to get most of your exits. In the world we're in now, um, these companies stay private for a long time and they get very, very hot. And the company is only selling like 10% in the series F or something. And there's appetite for someone wants the whole round and it's oversubscribed. So they're only selling 10 million, but there's like 50 million of appetite. What happens there is that the CEO says to all the investors and the employees, does anybody want to sell some of your holding in the company? Because the company only can justify taking in, say, 10 million. But like, like we had uh, Daily Harvest, these smoothies, all women company. We invested in that thing at like 30 million valuation. It's now probably worth around $5 billion. So it's a great investment. I haven't sold anything. So I'm in it at 30. It's worth $5 billion. We haven't sold anything. We're waiting. We're riding that escalator higher for, for us. The founders, they did a 47 million round with Lightspeed quite a long time ago. Of the 47 million, only 15 was primary that went into the company as working capital. The rest of it was people taking cash off the table, going and buying a house in Southern California, you know? So, so secondary IPO and M&A are the way you exit in a positive way. And, you know, it's kind of all over the place on individual deal by deal stuff. And it depends when you got in of how much you're willing to get out. I think it makes sense to, if I were investing my own capital, I would get off the escalator partially. So if it was just my money and I got into a uh, daily harvest at 30 million valuation, and it's now worth a lot more, I would have been selling 20% of my holding every six months, probably. And that's cash management. And I can recycle that money into new earlier stage invest investments. Thank you. Oh, that was great. Um, Rachel, I, I really liked your question. Uh, Rachel, do you wanna do you wanna share your question or do you want me to? Um, I don't have it in front of me right now. So if you could share it, that would be okay. Cool. Um, your LinkedIn profile said that you have traveled and worked in many different foreign countries. I'm someone that hopes to travel as I work when I'm older, as you travel and grow your network, how do you compare working with VCs in the US compared to other countries? Uh, did any culture differences or workplace norms hinder your work or connections? Yeah, so, um, you know, I've, I've lived, I was born in Japan, but like grew up in the States and then I finished high school in Paris. So I speak French and then I, I, I lived in Berlin for a year as a student, so that was all student. And then I've lived in a couple of other countries after, but just, in interest of time, um, I find that it's generally more difficult for me to do business outside of Silicon Valley. Even SoCal is a bit different and difficult. And um, even the, the interesting, interesting thing about Silicon Valley is that you have many investors at every stage. So it's a bit like going into that bar. Um, if you're trying to get your series B funded in Alabama, there's not even one door to knock on. There are no VCs in Alabama that have a strategy to fund a series B. So they have to go somewhere else. There's also probably no big balance sheet buyer like Google, Facebook, Adobe, endless list of companies in Silicon Valley that can buy your company. So what's interesting about the Valley is that we have so many investors that 
you can knock on the door for your series B funding or your series seed funding to a hundred people can say no. And the 101 will say yes. And so you have a better chance of survival there. On the exits, we talked about the exits. You have a better chance of exiting on a secondary M&A or IPO in the Valley than anywhere. IPO probably doesn't matter so much where you are as long as you're in the US and there's other exchanges if you're not in the US. You know, I find the difference in mentality among the cultures that is the most different that I interact with is mainland China. Even Hong Kong, Singapore, so much better to deal with than, than the cultural difference between mainland Chinese VCs and uh, the culture of Silicon Valley that I'm from. I find that New York is, we, we've had an office in New York for the last 10 years. I find the New York culture is very different. They're much more discounted cash flow like I value the company based on how much revenue it has. And I'm really worried of like, how come it's not profitable yet? Whereas on the West Coast, we understand that if Facebook didn't buy Instagram as pre-revenue for $1 billion, it would have been bought by Twitter. And everyone would go from Facebook photos to Twitter. And that would have cost more than 1% of Facebook's billion, 100 billion market cap at the time. And so it was worth it to buy it just to bury it six feet underground and make it stop it from going to Twitter. But then they even figured out how to lower the cost of acquiring new users, leveraging Facebook, keeping it independent. And it's been worth hundreds of billions for, or I don't know how many billions, but 1 billion was a bargain. So everyone in New York said you overpaid you know, they, they did not underpay. So there's a lot of cultural differences regionally within the United States, you know, from kind of Alabama to SoCal. A lot of LA companies raise money at very high valuations from celebrities. And like Madonna's like, oh, whatever, you know, just throws money into a deal. Whereas in Silicon Valley, I see thousands of companies come through my funnel. I'm not gonna overpay on a pre-revenue deal the way Madonna is doing with her agent in, you know, in, in SoCal. That's great. Um, Had has a question. Um, how do you recognize when a startup or public company has a product service that is a game changer and what du direction do you see AI heading in? I think you need to just answer the, the first part because we already talked a lot about AI. Yeah. 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 I mean, I mean like, there's a company, um, I won't say the name, but like they've got such amazing intelligent search, which is the one that like the guy sold his company, which became Amazon, that you can just tell that's a game changer. It's even frightening how it can work for almost anything. So we're trying to focus the CEO on like one key industry to focus on because he has customers coming in from everywhere asking him to do things. Um, another way to tell a simple answer to that question, a short answer is when the revenues all of a sudden are flying off the hook, you know, or when the revenues are not working. Sometimes we make a bet on a company and we're saying, how come people aren't, aren't, you know, using this more? And, and, you know, it's like the expression is, are the dogs eating the dog food? You invest in three dog food companies and you can only tell when the dogs are eating this like catnip dog food is the one that's working. Thanks and that's where I like to diversify and look like a genius. I put half the money into five deals. How could I tell they were game changers? Because it was working. It was generating revenue. Um, next question. How integral is having an MBA to attaining success in the VC world? Well, it depends. I mean, like, um, I don't think Sean Parker has an MBA, but he founded Napster and he advised... Um, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, and they went on some crazy roller coaster rides from Napster to Facebook. So he probably doesn't need an MBA. Um, me personally, I really needed the MBA. Like I was when, when I my first day of MBA, I was not a quant jock. I was a poet, and that that's what you know people said. Like I was all reading literature and languages and stuff in undergrad and philosophy. So I I didn't know how to use an HP calculator to save my life. So it was very beneficial for me to do the structured full-time MBA. 
the world is moving so fast. Like Peter Thiel is famous with the Thiel Foundation of I'll pay you $100,000 to drop out of undergrad. That's how much he thinks that the education is completely not, not right. Um, I think the short answer is if you're like me, you really had to do the full blown MBA. On the other hand, I didn't appreciate the amount of time they made me spend on statistics. And I'd like to slap the professor for being so greedy of my time. Statistics is total nonsense for me, um, where a lot of the other stuff is what I needed. Um, if you can get through life without an MBA, that's good. I honestly think. If you have to get it, like me, get it. Um, uh, maybe one, one other thing is, if you do the MBA, you better be interning at a real tech company, like a VC or a startup the whole time. Never take your feet out of the actual ocean. You know, always be, you know, don't be on the beach, just like drinking beer, getting your education. You know, if you're doing that, you should always be actively interning somewhere hot, developing your network and getting real experience. Um, maybe last question, and then I'll, I'll open up to the, to the rest of the students. Um, so what qualities do you think it takes to be a great CEO? Um, well, they come in different shapes and forms. Um, you know, you got like the Steve Jobs, who at the time was a hippie, not wearing shoes, crazy hair and smells bad. He doesn't believe in, you know, deodorant. And then you've got some, you know, polished Harvard MBA, Stanford MBA type. So they come in different shapes and sizes. But I think um, uh, all in grit and commitment is pretty big characteristic. So being willing to do lots of menial tasks and um, is a big one. Being versatile and flexible is an important characteristic. So you can be like, you know, put your helmet on and be like, uh, you know, un, you know, I, I'm never going to give up on this startup, but you need to kind of measure what the response is and be versatile, take advice on board and make changes to the product. So I think that, you know, there's one is I want to be stubborn. The other one is I, I don't want to be too stubborn. In fact, I need to be very, very, very uh, versatile. And um, I think you need to be good at selling. You need to be able to sell people on your vision to join your team. The biggest decision you ever make is your co-founders. So can you recruit really talented people, have the world of options to go with you? And can you convince people to put money into your company when they have a lot of options of where to put their money? So, and then you need to be good at sales to customers and get customers for revenue. And that's ultimately, if you can get a company that just takes off on revenue and retained earnings and is profitable from the first minute, I would not let the VCs own any of it, by the way. That's amazing advice. Um, any more questions, guys? Oh, two participants raised their hand. Uh, Christian. Yeah, I had a question. Uh, you were, uh, have a book about corporate VCs, and I think it was more interview based. But in your experience, um, for both the founder and the investor point of view, I guess first with the investors, what are some of the differences in terms of risk um, tolerance and criteria you look for differences between a corporate VC and a normal VC fund? And then also as a founder, what do you, what sort of benefits do you see going to a corporate VC instead of a normal fund? Yeah, we've only got like six minutes left and, and I've written a book on this topic so I can talk a lot and I have a lot of experience on that. I would say that the corporate VC is less sensitive to what kind of financial return they're going to make. If they, the, the, the corporate VC um, is perhaps even more interested in the strategic value this will bring to the existing conglomerate or large company than they are of, I bought into... Uh, daily harvest at 30 million and I exited at 5 billion. I'm, I'm largely financially driven. So I just want to, so I see a good company. I'm like, look, it's a great company, but the valuation is at 150 million pre in order to make a simple 10 X return. We have to exit at 1.5 billion with no funding and dilution between now and then. And I just don't believe the company is going to, I'm not going to get liquid at 1.5 billion to make a simple 10x return. I want to make 54x, 100x, 70x, 
to make up for my losers and move the needle on the whole fund to 10x plus. Whereas the, the, the corporate VC sometimes needs to get the head of a business unit who's not part of the investing team to sign a piece of paper saying we would do business with that company or we're, we have to sign a commercial agreement. So they might be trying to get a commercial agreement signed between a business unit in the corporate before he can even make the investment. So he, and, and that signed corp, corp deal, partnering deal is the evidence that there is strategic fit and it's not a purely financial investment. So the, the CVCs are gonna be typically slow. On valuation, they kind of don't care. If they invest at a 150 million valuation, and they exit at a 200 million valuation, they're not getting paid typically on the profit like I am. So they don't really care. And if they can make the company happy, the board is happy like, oh, you're investing in more self-driving flying cars. You made you know, BMW happy that you're getting us into the latest, whatever that is, you know, flying Ubers. So you know, from the entrepreneur, you, if you're worried about getting dilution and you want to raise a big round at a high at a high valuation, you might benefit from taking corporate venture capital funding and getting a business unit like Uber and Lyft got big valuations from the automotive car manufacturers, and they got leasing programs. So they, you know, if you if you can't if you're at the point that you're ready to drive Uber, you might not be able to afford a car, and it, and then all of a sudden Uber says, here's a car through our leasing program. So that grew their business a lot. So the strategics can add strategic value to be a distribution channel or a reseller or a customer where the financial VC cannot do that. And the CVC might invest at a higher valuation, but they also might want to buy your company later. And, uh, and like, you know, I brought Ericsson in to invest in a company, Node Prime, that I funded. And that all was pretty good. Then, then Ericsson bought the company the CBC wanted to buy it for the lowest price possible. I wanted to sell it at the highest price possible. So clearly the founders knew that they should be on my side, not listening to these people that are trying to buy it cheaply. It's a very complicated topic actually. That's amazing. Um, maybe we have time for one short question. Anyone have a brief question? I can go, yeah. What's the, um, real quick, thank you for talking to us. We really appreciate it. But what's, if you had to pick one, like your favorite memory or moment of your career, well, what would it be? Mm. It was probably when I signed the $25 million vendor financing agreement with Lucent. Um, at that moment, I was certain that I was gonna be able to be a billionaire philanthropist and back out, like, you know, fund the United Nations type stuff. You know, that was the most exciting moment. The truth is that IPO, I was worth 300 million on paper and it went to zero. But the factual answer of my career would have been I was sitting with Rich McGinn in the Lucent booth in Geneva at this trade show. They had an elevator in that booth, they had a baby grand piano, they had a restaurant in there. And we were in their top boardroom signing the deal. And I loved it. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, guys. Listen, thanks so much. I've got another call to jump on too. So Kevin, great, great. I hope everyone uh, becomes an entrepreneur in a VC or an investor in a VC fund. Thanks so much. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks Thank for you. Thank you. Today. Thank you. Wow. That was great. Um, let's, uh, let's take a quick um, seven minute break. Uh, a bio break, um, and let's reconvene at uh, 2.05.
Awesome. Great. Uh, what'd you guys think? Um, do you guys like Andrew? Yeah. Any questions about, uh, I guess, like his, his VC, his background, anything that, you know, he discussed? How'd you meet him, like, originally? I didn't meet him. Um, my, we have a, so my ex-co-founder deal, uh, from DealFlix, Sean, um, we were raising money and he was probably introduced to us through, um, through, uh, a mutual investor or maybe like a network event or startup pitch event. And then, um, Andrew, like I wasn't, I wasn't there when we actually raised like Sean, my other partner actually raised, uh, capital. Um, I was probably busy living in a van. But we stayed in touch. I mean, he he hit me up when I wrote my book. Um, randomly bumped into each other once um, during um, during a, a startup networking event in uh, Silicon Beach, and then um, he also kind of tried to help me when you know after I left Dealflix started to go under. And then the funny thing is, they try to sell Dealflix to the current startup by what I was in. When, the, the, when that current startup Cinemio was doing about 30 million a year. So I was like being the broker between the two companies. Um, so it was kind of fascinating. Like the company that fired me almost ended up being bought by the company I was the chief of business development for. And Andrew was uh, one of the persons I was talking to. But it was, it, was, it, was, it was weird. It was a very weird flex. And the deal almost happened, but... Um, the founder, Sean, um, he, his numbers were pretty fudged. So then the deal fell apart and I was really pissed off. <laughs> I'm like, dude, I'm trying to save your ass, even though you fired me from my own company. And even to the end, you're not coming out clean. So that was that. But yeah, any other questions? You, were you guys able to follow most of the dialogue when he's talking about LPs, 220, you know, um, corporate VC? um different ways of liquidating most of it okay any parts that you guys want to clarify or you know better understand no do you guys like like how quickly he would like drop references and whatnot i mean he just has a lot of knowledge so pretty good cool so no more questions right you guys andrew we're good Okay, so today um, we're going to do this. Um, I was looking at the syllabus. There are some concepts that I still want to cover in regards to, uh, in regards to um, um, uh, financial modeling and just like general corporate finance, but there's not a lot. So if you look at your, um, if you look at your, uh canvas right you're gonna see you're gonna see a bunch of uh videos that you're gonna watch this week and we're gonna discuss that um we're gonna discuss that uh next week right during next week's lecture but today i want you guys to get into groups i noticed that you guys had a lot of questions in regards to the analogs project so i want to help you guys understand it better while also having you guys work on your investment thesis uh, for your final uh, final presentations, um, but before we do that, let's let's do a couple of examples together in class. So let me just go ahead and kind of go through the slides real quick. So let's talk about um, the homework last week. Um, any volunteers? Anyone want to share their analogs? Okay. Let's pick on Kara's team. Okay, <laughs> I'll pull it up. Okay, thank you. I just made you a co-host as well, Kara. Okay. By the way, guys, um, I, you know, by this weekend or early next week, um, all the grades, um, you know, there's there's a midterm that's still not posted, and then I think a couple homework assignments. Um, it'll it should be caught up um, really soon. So, 
Um, I know there's, you know, a couple of you guys have asked, so apologies on that, um, but I'll, I'll make sure that's caught up uh, pretty soon. It's not letting me screen share still. Oh, okay. Um, try now. Okay. Oh, and I'll, I'll stop my screen. For the reason why. I think it has something to do with my settings. So it's making me, are you able to share it on your end? Or? Oh, yeah, 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 let's, let's do that, so. Sorry, if not, I have to quit Zoom and then like change my know. setting. I'll, I'll, um, I'll pull it up here, sorry about that. Okay, here we go. Okay, so why don't why don't you guys walk us through? Um, and it doesn't have to be just Kara. Um, it could be anyone from the team as well. Where okay, so mm -hmm. we can start here. Yeah. So first, we started with the. We kind of just took the template from class last week. So we had our qualitative information and we picked the most important ones. So we use growth stage, um, virtual and online services, recurring revenue, and for the market, we chose highly competitive. And then our descriptions or our rationale are as follows. And then for quantitative, we picked also the most important ones that we felt pertain to our um, company, which is Hubup. And so we picked market capitalization, um, accounts receivable, turnover, revenue growth, and then profit margin. Nice. Accounts receivable, turnover, uh, turnover. Can you explain this um, in more detail? Uh, yeah, I, sorry. I guess you're just looking for, you know, capital efficiency at this point. Yeah. Okay. And then why don't you go ahead and explain more of uh, this part, the analogs? Okay, so for the analogs, we basically just picked um, three different companies for each category. And then we all sort of determined, uh, we went down each row and we determined um, the X's kind of just marked what the company had. So for example, for Rocket, uh, we said that it was in the growth stage and we kind of used um, information that we were able to find online about that company. Um, and then we also said, I, I mean, like, I guess we were able to check the boxes based off of what we were able to find on the companies um, just through the internet. Yeah, sweet. So I think you, I think it's really cool that you guys put, um, you know, digital wealth management and then digital lending, you know, to mirror the product that you currently have um, that you're looking into, um, Hubook. Um, so that was really good. And then over here, um, these are the numbers, right, that you guys added? Yeah, so we sort of use like the 10K and Yahoo Finance to figure out these numbers. Some of them we had to calculate on our own, uh, but a lot of them we were able to find just straight from their 10K. So Riot and Marathon only have six and three employees. Is that, is that right? Yeah, um, surprisingly. Uh, Seriously, there's okay. yeah, because um, they just like 
you know, have the miners. They don't really need much employees. Hmm. But Canon still, Canon has like 300, right? Because they're selling the equipment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they need like R&D and all that good stuff. Okay, great. And, and then you guys narrowed it down to these three. How did you guys decide to narrow um, down, narrow it down to three? Can, 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 can one of you guys explain the rationale? Oh, so we narrowed down these three because we wanted one kind of a different character or one company from each different characteristic. So our industry was FinTech. So Rocket was for our digital lending characteristic and then Square was for payments and JP Morgan was for the digital wealth management. We did put JP Morgan in the mid stage, like in the sense of talking about uh, digital wealth management but like as a bank as a whole, I, I mean, they're probably late stage. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's great. And then now you have the, um, the Kager um, and then the blended rate. For the aggregate blend, how did you guys, um, how did you guys arrive on blending this, the dispersion or maybe the different weights? Is it, is it evenly weighted or um, how did you guys do that? Don't remember. I think it's just evenly weighted. Just evenly weighted? Yeah, one okay. third. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Um, that's great. So going back, I guess, if you were, you know, to potentially um invest in hubuck right um from this exercise that you guys saw like you know do you, do you guys find it helpful to kind of dissect all these numbers and figure out you know what percentage of the revenue or the gross profit um came out to be or what was i guess like you know your assessment on the company um based off of this Um, I think it kind of helped us understand what's growing in the industry. So we kind of realized digital wealth management is pretty hot right now, and it has it still has a lot of room to grow in the future. So we noticed that Hubuck has a lot of of uh, similar, I guess, products and services in that industry. Yeah, but you don't you don't have the financials yet. Okay. No, not yet. But that's something that we kind of like noticed that we should keep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's kind of a trick question. Um, but so this is like an exercise that's much more meaningful, right? If you are a VC or a PE firm looking at an actual deal. Um, but given the fact that Hubuck is a privately traded company um, and there's no financials on them yet, uh, this is an exercise, you know, that doesn't have much strength until, you know, the financials are received from, you know, um, from the from the firm. So if you're a startup or a VC, uh, this is helpful. Um, after you discuss with the founders, you know a lot of the stuff in um, a lot of the a lot of the stuff that you know um, you see here, and then you can apply it um, once you once you get the financials. So yeah, um, so this is this is really good. Um, you know this checks off like the fundamentals of the exercise. Um, it's not bad. Um, I mean, you, you guys selected like qualitative components, uh, quantitative components, um, you know, characteristics of the business, um, stages of the business, then you guys broke it down. And then, you know, where you guys were able to further break this down based on uh, their income statements and, and their balance sheets. And then you guys selected three companies. And then here we go with the, uh, the analog. So yeah, pretty straightforward stuff. Um, does anyone else have any questions or you know comments of um, Cara's group selection process or I guess uh, categories that they chose? No? Okay. So do, does the analog model make sense for most of you guys now or um, what are some of the questions that you guys might have 
be related to the analogs. Uh, just sort of how does it connect when we get, or hypothetically, if we have the target company's financials, how do we sort of connect and bridge the gap between the analog and the company? That's, I think, the... Uh, yeah, yeah, that's... I'll, I'll share with you guys a sim. I think it'll make more sense if I share with you guys um, an actual company's financials, right? Uh, so let me actually just stop the recording for a second because this deal is still somewhat live. Uh, hey, Car, can you make me a host again? I, I made you a host to share and now I can't uh, stop the recording. Okay, yeah, I think I just did it. Okay. Um, no, I can't. Oh, no, I got it, I got it. Okay, here we go. Okay. So normally, like if you're looking at a PE deal, um, you're gonna get what's called a SIM. A SIM 